So I'm here with Linus Wale from ST Ericsson. So Linus, um, you, I know you're, you were assigned with us uh, on the Kernel Working Group. Um, tell me a bit about yourself, like where you're from, um, what, what, did, what did you work at ST Ericsson? Yeah, I'm from Sweden, obviously, so uh, um, Swedish speaking and so on. And in ST Ericsson, like for, since 2004, yeah. I've been working 100% on the Linux kernel, more or less. And uh, from the beginning, that was uh, research activity, and uh, then it was productized step by step. Did ST Ericsson use Linux already in 2004 back then? Uh, it was more or less a research project. Like R&D. So, so uh, we were looking into the next generation of Java interfaces, yep. and the real Java machine needed fork, and the real-time operating system we had did not support fork. Ah, right. So we had to have an operating system which would do fork, and we would buy Beagle boards to get the Linux port, right. and run that to get in the fork call, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And uh, my objective was to get Linux onto our own hardware so we could run these demos and so on on, on uh, the ST Ericsson hardware itself. Right. And that's how the U300 port came around. Ah, okay. Hmm. Okay. So that's the, that's the history behind starting to use it in, in, in ST Ericsson? And one part of it. Right. They are, th then we merged companies with the ST Microelectronics wireless divisions. Yep and the Ericsson wireless divisions to form ST Ericsson mm -hmm. and they also had a, a Linux legacy right uh, like Andrea Gallo for example he comes from that heritage right whereas I'm from the Ericsson side right and now we join forces right that's cool so in the kernel working group I know you're doing some work on um, this piece of infrastructure which actually now is upstream is this and it's called Pinmux is that right uh, it's pin control actually pin control, okay. uh, in, initially I called it just Pinmux because it was all about multiplexing yeah and uh, now it's, uh, we sort of identified that the, en the entire piece that was, m was missing was about control in a bro broad sense. So it's not just about multiplexing, but multiplexing is a major part of it. And that piece of infrastructure could be considered stable. Right. Whereas the configuration stuff is still in a flux. So is this ARM only, this thing that we're working on? Uh, no, it's not. It's like, uh, it, it can be used by any, uh, SOC right. basically that needs to multiplex its pins so it will be applicable to Intel it will be applicable to Blackfin right. whatever system architecture. So tell me about like high-level multiplexing pins like what does this mean? So um, um, I've divided the subsystem into so, like pin control proper and then there's sort of two subcategories of uh, calls right. and one of them is multiplexing and one of them is other configuration. Right. So multiplexing is basically uh, a PGA or BGA package or something that you, you put your SOC in, it yep. has a limited number of pins yep. and you don't know uh, when you're buying that package uh, or when you're producing the package as an SOC vendor, you don't know how the customers you have are going to use these pins. Right. So you uh, make it software controlled essentially. You have a number of IPs and usually these can be like cheap stuff that you put on very small, it doesn't consume very much silicon, yep. but you figure that they might want them. Yeah. And maybe not yeah, yeah. and then it will be dead silicon but that's not a big problem the big problem is the number of pins the pins is a very limited scarce uh, scarcity economics resource oh, so you have lots of ip but you don't have enough pins to actually control the, 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 right. the soc is that it yes ah. so uh, in that design you might want to use these pins for this one thing and in that design you might want to use that set of pins for something else and right. that's what pin maxing is about and a multiplexer it's just like a in the, the most generic sense, it's like an electronic uh, telephone switch exchange or something like that. Right. But uh, usually it's more constrained like that. This device can only come out, come out on this specific set of pins and so on. But uh, you can max out a number of different peripherals and just the others, the other peripherals that you're not using, you just route them someplace else. Maybe they can come out on some other pins or you just disable them and sort of declock them, remove the voltage and they don't consume power for you. So. So what we're talking about here is like being able to ran, um, just configure access to different blocks of IP on the SOC, right? Yes. Do you do that Do you do that like in a running system, or is it something which you do statically and then you ship the system and that's that's it? Uh, both. Both. Yes. So uh, um, usually uh, in the most common systems that we're out there, we do that. Uh, um, you touch the multiplexing at boot mm -hmm. and uh, at shutdown. And maybe when you, you put the system idle, yeah. because you was, want to disconnect the pins so they don't uh, draw power, you want to ground them or something like that. Okay. So uh, it's usually when the system changes state, like when it boots, idles, resumes, goes, uh, yeah, shuts down. Yeah, yeah. 
So, uh, but you also have the runtime case. So for example, one thing that's been mentioned is that you have an I2C hardware block mm -hmm. and I2C uses two pins, yep. but you only have one I2C block, but it can be maxed to these two pins or these two other pins. So you have to switch it back and forth between those pins to do the transactions on both buses. And that's actually right. possible to do with a pin control system. Uh, I don't, I'm not saying that this is a good idea, hardware-wise speaking. It's very strange, right? Yes, it's strange, but that, that kind of example has actually turned up in practice. So the, the, what we have, the support that we have in the upstream kernel, I think it went into 3.2, is that right? Mm, that's, that's correct, yes. And so what's, what's the next step? What are we doing afterwards? Uh, right now we're working on two things. Uh, we have added a configuration API, and configuration, apart from multiplexing, that's about uh, electric stuff you do with pins. Right. So like pulling them up to, uh, with a resistor, pulling them down, biasing in other ways, driving them with multiple drive strengths and uh, uh, that kind of stuff. Right. So uh, that, is, that, that is one piece of what infrastructure, infrastructure we're putting in place. Then after, after we have that, uh, we want to be able to bring in data and uh, configure the entire multiplexing and the other configuration from the device tree. Right, right, right. So um, apparently some big customers out in the world have put requirements on some, uh, let us say, handset vendors yeah. to provide device tree uh, configuration of their things, their handsets and tablets and so on. And this then uh, moved down to the uh, SOC vendors yeah. as a requirement. And uh, so finally, it says that now it's, and now it's within the yeah, it comes to us. Yeah, okay. So uh, uh, it's, it's quite funny, funny because the pin control subsystem, when I started it, was just like a consolidation effort. So I, yes, this piece is like a hobby. I can, I can probably consolidate this. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, everybody started to come into it. Because it turns out that when you're using device trees to configure a tablet or handset or something, mm -hmm. this is the one piece you can't configure with a device tree. Right. You can configure I2Cs, SPIs, uh, GPIOs, everything, except for the pin control stuff. Right. So in order to close the loop and have uh, the platform, I call this the platform perimeter. Mm -hmm. In order to control the entire platform perimeter, you need pin, con config and pin control support. And so device tree work is device tree bindings for that is, is also ongoing. That is also ongoing, yes. Is it hard is it a hard problem? Um, what what's hard about it, I guess, is the better What's question. hard about it is that people need to agree on how to do it. Yeah. And uh, we solved that sort of I think yesterday. So all the people that have been disagreeing in the mailing lists, I put all these people in the same room yeah. and then I went away. <laughs> and came, came back, back uh, like half an hour an hour later and uh, they were in agreement. <laughs> cool story. So that's how we go about it. All right. Linus, thanks very much and thanks for the time. Thank you. Cheers.